Floyd? George Floyd. George Floyd repeatedly told the officers that he could not breathe after an officer knelt on his neck. In widespread unrest not seen in decades, American cities from Seattle to Washington, D.C. burned as many peaceful protests during the day turned to rioting and destruction by night. Governors in 12 U.S. states have activated National Guard troops to quell the violence and restore order. No peace! It was the latest move in a week of escalating tensions after George Floyd died in police custody. Um, I think of a lot of things. The first thing I think is that we actually do have an ideological frame. Um, myself and Alicia in particular are trained organizers. Um, we uh, are trained Marxists. To me, there's no such thing as, as a black woman in Ghana. I'm a woman in Ghana. Living in the U.S., all of the seats are taken, all the big brands are there. And here, you have an opportunity to create a seat at the table. It's significant to, to know where you belong and where you came from. Dan Pastor Nguyen, I'm a graduate of Andrews University, in Michigan, uh, U.S. of A. From Solusi, also hold two degrees behind my back, and uh, pastored Zimbabwe, Botswana, a bit of Namibia, South Africa, did London and uh, U.S. Yeah. And, and back. But basically, I've spent lots of my times around the religious corners, and uh, what pushed me to where I am now is. Uh, the negligence of the church on dealing with social issues and particularly also the misunderstanding on cultural education. Yes. So I decided to do a bit of research and that led me to the start, the starting of my writing and uh, starting to question, questioning things and looking for new paradigms. When we say the names, right, so we speak their names, we say her name, say their names, we do that all the time, that you kind of invoke that spirit and then those spirits actually become present with you. Right. The first thing that we do when mm. we hear of a murder mm. is we come out, we pray, we pour libation, we build with the community where um, mm -hmm. the person's life was stolen. Mm -hmm. And it took almost a year for me to realize that this movement is much more than a racial and social justice movement. At its core, it's a spiritual movement. <laughs> Welcome to this presentation, everyone, titled The Roots of Rastafarianism and Social Justice. We'll start with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray that you may give us understanding, guide me, and may we all be blessed through this presentation, O oh Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Um, just to note, there are two parts to this, so make sure you go watch part two where we bring everything together. We'll also look at the meaning of a true Nazarite and its relation to the Sabbath. So let's go ahead with part one. Now, as we see here, a lot of uh, Rastas are known by their hairstyle, their dreadlocks. Rastafari originated among impoverished and socially disenfranchised Afro-Jamaican, so it was in Jamaica back in the 1930s. It was influenced by both Ethiopianism and the Back to Africa movement. It actually gained increased respectability within Jamaica and greater visibility abroad through the popularity of Rasta-inspired reggae musicians, most notably Bob Marley. Now, the Rastafari movement began among Afro-Jamaicans who wanted to reject the British imperial culture that dominated Jamaica and replace it with a new identity based on the reclamation of their African heritage. Its emphasis is on the purging of any belief in the inferiority of black people and the superiority of white people. 
Marcus Garvey, who was a proponent of the Black nationalism and Pan-Africanism movements, inspired the Nation of Islam and the Rastafarian movement. He had a prophecy where it said, look to Africa where a Black king shall be crowned, he shall be the Redeemer. And this is the prophecy that the movement, the Rastafarian movement, based their belief on. He, Marcus Garvey, also created a shipping line, the Black Star Line Steamship Corporation, where it was to facilitate the transportation of goods. And eventually, African Americans throughout the African global economy. Now, Leonard Howell was the first Rasta. When he was a teenager, he traveled a lot. He traveled as a seaman between Panama and New York City and even to Europe, finally opening a tea room in Harlem in 1924. Now these experiences exposed how to Pan-Africanism as well as Marxism, communism and various trends of black nationalism. During his time in New York, he joined fellow Jamaican Marcus Garvey's Universal Negro Improvement Association, UNIA, founded in 1914. When Howell returned to Jamaica in 1932, two years after Hale Selassie uh, the first was crowned emperor of Ethiopia, he began holding public meetings, fusing all that he'd learned. So we're talking about Pan-Africanism, Marxism, Communism, Black nationalism. He fused all of that and he began um, holding public meetings. Um, and one of his uh, biggest people, class of people that he attracted was the Jamaica's underclass. So we see, and this is what really started the movement. It's um, all these beliefs put together um, that uh, got the movement going. And Hale Selassie was crowned in 1930, as we saw previously. His title was by the conquering line of the tribe of Judah, his imperial majesty, Hale Selassie the first king of kings of Ethiopia, elect of God. And for them, this was an accomplishment. This was a fulfillment of uh, Marcus Garvey's prophecy. And even they related to in the book of Revelation. Now, Tefrai was born to the royal line of Ethiopia in 1892, who traditionally claimed descent from King Solomon. He started his career as a Rast or Duke, making him Rastafari. Upon ascending to the throne, he adopted the name he would carry into history, Hale Selassie I. Now, it is to be noted that many and the Rastafarian movement view Hale Selassie as uh, divine and even when he was crowned as uh, the second coming of Jesus. Selassie means power of the Trinity and I encourage all of you to watch other videos in our channel where we talk about the Trinity and its agenda. Now, one thing to note about the Ethiopia, um, as we will read here, the history of the churches of Ethiopia and Abyssinia is especially significant. Amid the gloom of the Dark Ages, the Christians of Central Africa were lost sight of and forgotten by the world, and for many centuries they enjoyed freedom and the exercise of their faith. But at last, Rome learned of their existence, and the Emperor of Abyssinia was soon beguiled into an acknowledgement of the Pope as the Vicar of Christ. Other concessions followed. An edict was issued forbidding the observance of the Sabbath under the severest penalties. The papal tyranny soon became a yoke that the Abyssinians determined to break it from their necks. After a terrible struggle, the Romanists were banished from their dominions and the ancient fate was restored. The churches rejoiced in their freedom and they never forgot the lesson they had learned concerning the deception, the fanaticism, and the despotic power of Rome. 
So as we see, the churches of Africa held the Sabbath, especially Ethiopia, <clears throat> as it was held by the papal church before her complete apostasy. While they kept the seventh day in obedience to the commandment of God, they abstained from labor on the Sunday in conformity to the custom of the church. Now this lasted a very long time, but unfortunately, especially nowadays, the Ethiopian Orthodox Church upholds Sabbath, Sabbath, observing the Sabbath day, but in addition to the Lord's Day, which many other Christians believe as being the Sunday, so, but they put more emphasis because of the resurrection of Christ uh, upon Sunday nowadays, unlike back in the days where they were more about the seventh day as we see in the Bible. Now the benefit of that, as they were observing the true Sabbath, they also had um, peace in their land. By 1914, around 90% of Africa was under European control. However, because of their locations, economies, and political status, Ethiopia and Liberia avoided colonization. Now, back in 1895, um, Italy tried to take over, but they were defeated by the Ethiopians. And it wasn't until October 3rd, 1935, that uh, the Italian dictator Benito Mussolini ordered a second invasion of India, of Ethiopia, sorry. And on May 9th, 1936, Italy succeeded in taking over Ethiopia. And this caused Hale, the Emperor Hill Selassie to flee into exile, where it, was after, it wasn't until after five years, May 5th, 1941, when he was restored to the Ethiopian throne, that independence was regained. So for this whole time, until Selassie um, was in power, that uh, Italy, interestingly, Italy took control of Ethiopia. But before that, they were always free and also way before that also there were observers of the true sabbath so we see the benefit there and one of the reasons that uh, the italians gave to occupy ethiopia was because they did not banish slavery um, many countries were pressuring um, emperor selassie to do so and i I think uh, he tried to do so in phases, but they didn't want to take it out completely um, to the point that he even caused Marcus Garvey to criticize him, criticize him saying, it is preferable for the Abyssinian Negroes and the Negroes of the world to work for the restoration and freedom of the country without the assistance of Selassie, because at best he is but a slave master. Um, He's actually said to have owned slaves by the thousands, although he abolished it after he came back um, in power um, in 1941. So it wasn't until after, around that time, that he completely abolished slavery. Now, because of uh, their freedom, many surrounding nations uh, wanted to be um, like uh, Ethiopia, because as we saw, 90% were under colonization. So with the use of that influence that he had, um, the emperor tried to unite Africa. And now this organization that he put together is was replaced with the African Union. And back in 2015, many African bishops took the first step on having representation at the African Union. So, and that was so that they could enhance the Holy See's participation in the organization. So we see although uh, as he's trying to unite Africa uh, with, based on this Pan-Africanism movement, um, nowadays it's being influenced by the papacy. Now, what, what, what was the result of his reign in Ethiopia, talking about Hale Selassie. 
The DERG was fought, formally renamed the Provisional Military Administrative Council. And in September 1974, they overthrew the government of the Ethiopian Empire and Emperor Hale Selassie during mass protests. They abolished the monarchy and embraced communism as an ideology. So the result, people of the last emperor of Ethiopia was communism. The people protested, they didn't want it anymore. And, by the, and what followed, by the mid 1890s, Ethiopia was ravaged by multiple issues such as droughts, economic decline, in the 1983 to 1985 famine. This was followed by increasing reliance on foreign aid and a gradual resurgence of conflicts. Now the PDRE or the People's Democratic Republic of Ethiopia um, inherited many issues from the Derg during the Derg era, you know, just like we mentioned the famine and the reliance of foreign aid and eventually, um, they were it was ended in 1991 so from 1974 to 1991 um what came after selassie's uh, reign was communism and that even furthered the country into deeper problems many more issues so we saw a de decline you know from keeping the sabbath having freedom and then we have selassie in power um which uh means uh power of the trinity and a decline from then on you know occupation of uh being occupied by italy for five years and the great fa famine from 1983 to 1985 and so on so that ended the monarchy um after that time now let's take a trip to india um, to further understand what shaped the, the Rastafarianism movement. Between 1845 and 1921, over 36,000 Indians were brought to Jamaica. They were di dispersed to many plantations. Although some went back, but more than two thirds remained making Jamaica their home. They survived by building bonds with other communities on the island and learning their religious and cultural practices. Interracial marriages between Indian and African communities were not uncommon, which also led to closer cultural and economic integration. Indians also introduced ganja, or cannabis, which is uh, very popular among uh, um, the Rastafarian movement, which they use in their rituals. It's a way for them to draw closer um, to, to their God, to become more spiritual um, as they do so. And they also use it for, for healing purposes. We'll see for a little bit further more. Now the Sadhus, as we see here, they look very similar to the Rastas with their dreadlocks. Um, these are the matted hair. Um, they worship Shiva, which is a pen, Hindu deity revered widely by Hindus in India, Nepal, and Sri Lanka. He is the supreme being within Shaivism, one of the major traditions within contem contemporary Hinduism. Now, as you see also, the matted hair, just like the sadhus and the crescent moon. This is Shiva here, the trident, which represents the trinity and the snake as we see um, described in the book of Genesis. In Hindu, there's also this festival called Holi, where the people consume bang, which contains cannabis flowers. It is believed that Shiva created cannabis from his own body to purify the elixir. In Hinduism, wise drinking of bang, according to religious rites, is believed to cleanse sins unite one with Shiva and avoid the miseries of hell and the future life. It is also believed to have medicinal benefits. So we see the similarities and how um, the Hindu religion greatly influenced um, what came about the Rastafarian movement. And as, as we saw Selassie meaning power of the trinity well 
The Hindu also have the Trinity, which is comprised of Brahma, the Creator, Vishnu, the Preserver, and Shiva, the Destroyer. So this Rastafarian movement is based a lot on the Trinity also, if we go back in time and see what shaped their belief. Um, in India, we have the caste system. Many believe that the groups originated from Brahma, the Hindu god of creation, which is part of the Trinity. Um, the system bestowed many privileges on the upper caste while sanctioning repression of the lower caste by privileged groups. Often criticized for being unjust and regressive, it remained virtually unchanged for centuries, trapping people into fixed social orders from which it was impossible to escape. Now, the people at all the way at the bottom, they're the outcasts. Um, there were street sweepers, latrine cleaners, and even considered ad, as untouchable. So we see um, this uh, religious system, um, out of it came out this caste where some are seen better than others. And to quickly jump into politics, Kamala Harris, where well, her mom, which is uh, from Indian descent, and her dad, Donald Harris, um, which is a uh, Jamaican, her mom used, she said that her mom used to bring her to Hindu temples. And her husband is Jewish. And she herself considered herself as a Baptist Christian. Um, Don Harris, her father, is a prominent Marxist professor. And after she posted a video on social media, she was criticized of being a socialist, um, endorsing communism, which is very interesting to note. Now, the Trinity, as we mentioned before, the meaning of uh, Selassie, and we even find it in Hindu religion, um, even goes back um, um, during Egypt, where they worship uh, Osiris, Horus, and Isis. So the Trinity or the mystery of the Trinity is the central doctrine of the Catholic faith. Upon it are based all the other teachings of the church. Something to keep in mind. Ecumenism, a spiritual process rooted in the Trinity, Pope says. And we know that's the movement that the papacy is using to reunite all the churches, all the religion, to bring things back the way they were. Can a leopard change its spot where they, where they will be in control of all religion, letting people what to do, who to worship, when to worship, and how to worship. The Pope also said back in 2016, it is the communists who think like Christians. This is very interesting because Karl Marx, who was, was a founder, his object in life was to dethrone God and destroy capitalism. The first requisite of the happiness of the people is the abolition of religion. Now, what does God say about the, this um, economic system? There are many who urge with great enthusiasm that all men should have an equal share in the temporal blessings of God. But this was not the purpose of the Creator. A diversity of condition is one of the means by which God designs to prove and develop character. Yet he intends that those who have worldly possessions shall regard themselves merely as steward of his goods, as entrusted with means to be employed for the benefit of the suffering and the needy. It would be the greatest misfortune that has ever befallen mankind if all were to be placed upon an equality in worldly possessions. So we see when we have diversity, it's actually better. It gives us the opportunity to develop our character, to become more Christ-like. When we all have equal worldly possession, it makes it harder to do so. And that was not God's intention, the prophet says. Now, many nowadays, especially after George Floyd's uh, death, 
uh, with the Black Lives Matter movement are saying no justice, no peace. There's a lot of unrest in the world today. When we enter the most holy place or the holy of holies in the Ark of the Covenant were the two tables of stone. In it, we had the, we had the 10 commandments. And pretty much it is saying, we cannot have rest unless we follow the Ten Commandments, unless we follow the, the, we worship the true God. Only then can our brothers and sisters experience justice, experience liberty. When we're worshiping the false God, the Trinity, then it will result into slavery for my neighbor, and we will never have true rest. And the plan of the enemy is a actually come up with a false rest where we will receive the false spirit we'll look into that a little bit more by taking some examples but something to underline something to point out to bring is that true worship of god the first three commandments is by accepting christ and only then can we receive the spirit spirit of god which will lead us into all truth as we receive Christ, we receive the Father, and the Holy Spirit is there to lead us to both. So we need to allow the Godhead to do its work in us so that uh, we may have peace that we are all looking for. We may have justice. Some example is the Pharisees who they rejected Christ because they weren't worshiping the true God. And we saw how they were not, they didn't, not, they didn't have any compassion towards their fellow brothers. They were actually, fellow brethren, sorry. They were actually um, very um, critical, very judgmental of their brothers and sisters. And they were the ones that actually missed out on Christ, the Redeemer. And as we saw in our video, I strongly recommend to go check it out, is uh, Mark of the Beast, Solomon and the Beast, how to define the beast. We see that Solomon, from the wisest and most merciful of rulers, he degenerated into a tyrant. Once the compassionate, God-fearing guardian of the people, he became oppressive, and tax after tax was levied upon the people that means might be forthcoming to support the luxurious court. So because he got into idolatry, although he was worshiping the true God at first, but got into idolatry, worshiping idols, that ended up causing him to be, become a tyrant unto the people. Many tax were levied upon them. And we see the same with the papacy during the Dark Ages persecuting those that did not accept their belief, persecute and, and causing them to um, pay indulgences, to build buildings and work on many projects that they had for their gain, for their selfish reasons. So again, we're seeing um, false worship, what it leads to the consequences of it towards our brothers and sisters. Anarchy is seeking to sweep away all law, not only divine, but human. The centralizing of wealth and power, the vast combinations for the enriching of the few at the expense of the many, the combinations of the poor classes for the defense of their interests and claims, the spirit of unrest, of riot and bloodshed, the worldwide dissemination of the same teachings that led to the French revolution all are tending to involve the whole world in a struggle similar to that which convulsed france and we know that after the french revolution one of the results of the french revolution was that they tried to get rid of the bible you know so those people that were victim of injustice victim of uh, um the centralizing of wealth and power in return they didn't want to follow God at all. They just wanted to follow the God of wisdom. They went into idolatry. So we see the enemy work in both camps as he's causing many to worship the false God. 
those that end up being victim of oppression, of injustice by the worship of these false gods, he starts having them take matters in their own hand and also depart from the true God. Um, and we will see, so what is the enemy trying to do with uh, all these injustice happening to the black community right now? Um, as we see that uh, Satan has long been preparing for his final effort to deceive the world. The foundation of his work was laid by the assurance given to Eve and Eden, he shall not surely die. And the day that ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Genesis 3, verses 4 and 5. Little by little, he has prepared the way for his masterpiece of deception and the development of spiritualism. He has not yet reached the full accomplishment of his designs, but it will be reached in the last remnant of time. Says the prophet, I saw three unclean spirits like frogs. They are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty, found in Revelation 16. Except those who are kept by the power of God through faith in his word, the whole world will be swept into the ranks of this delusion. The people are fast being lulled to a fatal security to be awakened only by the outpouring of the wrath of God. So it's no coincidence that all these movements are resurfacing nowadays where many people are um, promoting going back uh, to Africa, the black community wanting to embrace their roots, wanting to embrace spiritualism, all the belief, the practices that their ancestors used to do. Um, and we see that it's a deception from the enemy. All this is a result of all the injustice that uh, they have suffered throughout all the years but clearly we see through the word of god that this is a deception that the key is to hold on to christ when the holy spirit is poured out there will be a triumph of humanity over prejudice and seeking the salvation of the souls of human beings god will control minds human hearts will love as christ loved and the color line will be regarded by many very differently from the way in which it is now regarded. To love as Christ loves lifts the mind into a pure, heavenly, unselfish atmosphere. He who is closely connected with Christ is lifted above the prejudice of color or caste. His faith takes hold of eternal realities. The divine author of truth is to be uplifted our hearts are to be filled with the faith that works by love and purifies the soul the work of the good samaritan is the example that we are to follow so what's the answer to everything that's happening is um our relationship with christ our connection people are actually doing the opposite with the rastafarian movement we see that uh, because of uh, what they were going through because of the culture um, the, that was dominant back then, the British culture, that uh, they decided to follow a man um, and make him God instead of focusing on Christ. It was never God's purpose that society should be separated into classes, that there should be an alienation between the rich and the poor, the high and the low, the learn and the unlearn, but the practice of separating society into distinct circles is becoming more and more decided. God designed that those to whom he entrusted talents of means, ability, and gifts of grace should be good stewards of his beneficence and not seek to reap all the advantages for themselves. God does not estimate men by the amount of wealth, talent, or education that he may have, he values men in proportion as he becomes a good steward of his mercy and love. Those who center everything upon themselves misinterpret the character of God. The Lord designed that the gifts he bestows upon men should be used to minister to the unfortunate and the suffering ones 
among humanity. And some examples, we see Brent Jean here, who decided to forgive the officer that killed her, his brother. And also Jim is still, who is a Canadian um, CEO, um, CEO, and he, with his own money, decided to work, help over 50 Syrian refugees, um, where he helped them to start all over, gave them money to learn the language, adapt to their culture, and even gave them a position at his company. So we're seeing examples of what God wants from people um, in these situations, like giving us opportunities to work our character. Um, I hope that this was a blessing as we're seeing the enemy is working both camps. He's using a group of people to persecute others and those that are persecuted, he's um, telling them to take matters in their own hand, to forget about the God of heaven and to find justice their own way. And as we will see in part two, the, the true meaning of Nazareth, because many in the Rastafarian movement believe that they are keeping the Nazareth vow which is why they have dreadlocks like Samson. But we will see in part two the true meaning of Nazareth and its relation to the Sabbath. Um, I hope you are blessed. Remember, Christ is in the midst.